Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Of course, building science uh, is what that BS stands for. Tonight's topic is avoiding mold and fungus in our buildings. Um, I'm Travis Brungard. I'm in Kansas City. Uh, frankly, I'm in Prairie Village. And I'm drinking uh, a Jubru Funky Farm Waka Waka Wit from my friend Dan in a Rockwell koozie. And I'm already about halfway through it. So forgive me if I'm a little bit happier or sillier than usual. Um, so BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our, our Zoom show. The Brew Crew and our guests volunteer our time each week to bring you what we hope will be a fun and informative discussion. Uh, of course, we want to thank you to our survey responders. Uh, we received over 120 surveys back with a lot of useful information, and we'll do our best to incorporate your suggestions. Uh, we would also have to thank Green Building Advisor and, of course, Fine Home Building Magazine for their uh, perpetual support. And then I will kick it over to Ben, who will handle announcements. Uh, I'm Ben Bogey. I am a project manager in Connecticut. And this evening, I am drinking a, uh, oh, the camera's working with me, a Delve, which is from uh, Kent Falls Brewing, my local brewery here, who I absolutely adore. Uh, it's some sort of uh, IPA. Um, so announcements. Uh, first off, you can find the chat box if you're new to the platform at the bottom of the screen. Be sure to click all panelists and attendees in the little blue bar so that everyone can see your questions and comments. Fine Home Building sends out Zoom reminders each week. If you want to receive those as well as other information, join our mailing list at thebsandbeershow.com or check out the weekly post at Green Building Advisor that goes up on Sunday mornings. The video recordings of tonight's show will be available at the Green Building Advisor and all past shows can be found on YouTube and through a link at thebsandbeershow.com. An audio-only version of the BS and Beer Show is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And special announcement. Did it, did it, did it. You may have heard the Pretty Good House team is writing a book. They're looking for some case studies to include in it. If you have designed or built what you consider to be a pretty good house, submit your projects through the link shared in the chat box. And I'll toss these chat box uh, links up there along with some other uh, relevant organizations. And off to you, Travis, for introductions. Fantastic. Uh, so tonight we are introducing uh, Cheryl C. Echo, who is a frequent speaker at architecture and engineering conferences around the U.S., participating on the board of directors for Association of Licensed Architects, Architects in Illinois and the American Lumber Standards Committee. With over 30 years of knowledge, research, and professional experience, Cheryl offers pr proven design, construction, and renovation solutions to solve building challenges economically, which we really appreciate in the building trades. Thank you for that. Uh, Cheryl and her own family experienced mold and toxin exposure, taking years from their home and health to recover from the effects. This has motivated her to help others avoid ending up in the same situation. She brings tenacious research abilities, analytical thinking, and experience to the topic of environmental health while sharing design and construction solutions that make the difference. Based in the Chicago area, Cheryl holds a BS in architecture with high honors from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and a Master of Architecture degree from the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis. Cheryl's, fine, excuse me, Cheryl's free mold education kit, courses and videos are available at avoidingmold.com. Cheryl, it is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for joining us. Do you happen to have a drink that you're enjoying this evening? I am, but I am not drinking beer. So I am having a San Pellegrino with a drop of lemon essential oil in it. Ooh, that's fancy. Additives are the next big thing, right? Um, I guess. <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm having. So I actually almost forgot when I got on. I was like, oh, wait. I need my beverage. It's very important to lubricating the process. <laughs> uh, can I ask you, did I miss anything exciting in your, in your bio there? Is there something you're excited <laughs> about that you're working on that's not included in the, the credentials and all that? What's going uh, on? What can you tell us? No, um, I think you covered it all. There was a lot there. Uh, no, I just got back though from, uh, we were six and a half weeks on the road, my husband and I. So where'd you um, go? We went, we drove from Chicago to California and back. That's and a lot of driving. It was a lot of driving and a lot of stopping along the way and a lot to see along the way. And I find that I, um, I use that as a tool to investigate buildings. I look at indigenous architecture. I look at, I mean, we, we're the ones that are like, whoa, go over there. Look, they're building houses. And, um, <laughs> and then I jump out of the car with my video going, hey guys, this is not a good idea. Um, 
<laughs> You're saving lives out there. You're doing I the good am, work. I am. And then I have a whole stream of videos on YouTube of me talking about toilet facilities. <laughs> so, all well, over the world. Too. So, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there are little buildings that are either, I mean, we all have plumbing in our, in our homes and that's the one thing we can't change. And so they're, I find things always to talk about. I don't know what I'm going to find when I leave, um, but I do find things to talk about and hopefully it's helpful. I think it is, but I find defects and sometimes I even find good work. And I talk about that too. Uh, we appreciate that. Finding good work and defects are both equally important. Praise the good and help the bad is the, the way to do it. So we're very grateful that you've taken the time to join us tonight. Uh, I feel like it would be silly to not give Patrick an opportunity to introduce himself as well. Patrick, I don't have a bio to read for you. Uh, we've met and I like you. So say some good things about yourself and tell us what you're drinking as well. Hi, everybody. I work for Fine Home Building as a senior editor and host a Fine Building po uh, Home Building podcast. Tonight, I am drinking uh, my local favorite uh, for, you know, regular consumption, uh, Two Roads Honey Spot Ale from uh, Stratford, Connecticut, and uh, it's quite delicious. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I have lots of interest in mold going way back. Well, what do you mean by that? Going way back, how do you mean? So my house that I grew up in uh, was really moldy, uh, wet basement, uh, bad uh, bad conditions. And I had asthma growing up. And, you know, people say you outgrow asthma. But I think the reality is, uh, for many people, you leave the moldy place where you were living, right? <laughs> that is probably more accurate. Okay. We have uh, a, a fair amount of... Uh, go ahead, Ben. That out and you were able a little beside, behind the scenes housekeeping. Uh, Bill is uh, back. Sorry, we were waiting. Bill kind of dropped down on us. Patrick, will you please promote him? I can do that. Uh, we may have Bill just for audio momentarily because I believe he's in the process of driving. Um, oh. Patrick, you mentioned having a wet basement. My wife and I once rented a house that the basement was so wet we had what looked like lasagna noodles growing out of the basement slab. Yeah. It was an experience. Oh, I can't find Bill over here in the guest uh, lineup. Did it? Is it possible we lost him again? Do you see him? Yeah, it is. He was there a couple of seconds ago. So, uh, Travis, would you mind just introducing Bill, and then we'll keep our eyes out for uh, yeah, Bill to I, pop in? I'm guessing a lot of our audience already knows Bill, so this will be very smooth when he does get to join us with video. Uh, everybody knows mean old Bill Robinson. Bill Robinson's a nationally known construction trainer and presenter. He demonstrates the proper use of building products in various parts of the country and at dozens of annual trade shows. Um, I know him through his involvement with the Skills USA. Um, Bill's expertise is understanding, detailing, and managing the building envelope. He has written articles for the Journal of Light Construction and Fine Home Building, among other publications. And he's worked on the floor of International Builders Show, The Remodeling Show, JLC Live. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about Bill Robinson, visit train2build.com. Train2build.com with the number two there in the middle. Uh, so Bill will be joining us. He just texted me. He's driving and he's trying to make it work. But we're in luck because we have Cheryl and we have Patrick. So... <laughs> And Bill's uh, going to be with us shortly, I think. Yes. It's all going to work out. And Cheryl so was going to do the presentation anyway, right? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. So I just have to share my screen and, um, and we can go. Let me see how I do that. And this will get a little interesting because I, I have two host disabled participant screen sharing. So... That's a, that's a mean trick we like to play on first time guests. Uh, <laughs> next, your computer will start smoking and then someone will come by and drink your drink. Uh, that's all part of the package. Yeah, it's when a, I see it's a hazy. Come across and like... <laughs> that's right. It's like the whammy from uh, Pressure Lock. He just kind of comes around and, oh boy, I'm old. That's a tough reference. Oh, Sorry, man. guys. But it's only about a, a pack a day habit for the computer smoking. So it's nothing too serious. <laughs> So can somebody enable me? Because it keeps. I think, I, think I can do that. that if I made you a. Telling me I'm disabled. Yes, co-host. So uh, I think Ben and I had scheduled a, a dance routine uh, <laughs> that we had choreographed to fill this time. But since we're in separate spaces still, just imagine it's sort of a hula play. Uh, there's a coconut bra uh, for me and Ben. What is it? What were you going to go with for that? Oh, I'm just going to wear my beard as a skirt. Oh, all natural. There it is. Thank goodness, so Patrick. So we see the presenter's view right now. And there you go. There perfect. is what we're after. Okay. So 
Um, great. I'm glad you guys can tell me what you see because I can't see you guys now. So, um, but anyway, so what I'm going to do here is a little bit of a presentation that I actually offer through my website, morningwall.com, that you guys have mentioned. This is, this is about 15 to 20 minutes of it, um, the introduction section. And I think it's a good overview to talk about the fungus among us, which is what we're, uh, what we're working on, I guess. And it's a big topic. I have a little disclaimer because I do mention health and I am not a medical practitioner of any kind. I am an architect, as you mentioned. And so it's not intended to treat or diagnose any medical conditions. Um, and I do usually do these for professionals. So um, I always recommend people get an, a professional involved in their project. It's, uh, it's really a complicated topic and it is copyrighted. So it's about 20 minutes when I went through it and I'd touch on mold background and building science and materials and how that's related. Um, all, as I said, complicated and I'm always trying to figure out how to do this as simply as possible. But my object objectives today in this short time is what is building mold, who is affected and why buildings and why now? Um, this, the rest of this presentation, which you can find through my website, under the education tab is I go into how to identify potential building problems and resources and oftentimes find home building is among my resources. So you guys do a great job. You described me really well, so I don't have to say too much about that. I would like to mention that I have worked for five years for the wood industry as a senior technical director. And um, so my that's where I started teaching actually and teaching my peers, architects, structural engineers and code officials on topics related to wood, structural wood, in use in commercial buildings, which is basically the same as, as residential, but a little more complicated. And uh, yeah, so that's, I was in, my specialty was durability, sustainability, and fire. And uh, yeah, that's where I kind of, my career morphed for five years, and then I um, came out and was going to do wood consulting and ended up doing, well, actually ended up with a sick family again, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I am on the Lumber Standards Committee. I am a mom, although my kids are all grown. I have had toxin exposure. And like you, Patrick, I grew up in a basement bedroom. Um, nothing really obvious, but I think in retrospect, it was part of my burden. Uh, I ended up with autoimmune disease and Lyme disease, and as did many others in my family, actually almost all of us. And, uh, and we've recovered our health using natural and non-toxic products. And it's usually what I recommend. But we are all thriving and because of that, uh, I share my story and I share what I can in terms of what I've learned, the mistakes I've made. And, um, and I would say finally, but actually it never really ends. There's always something else around the corner that we're struggling with or, or something new. But my story actually goes back to 2005 when my daughter was 10 and she had full on asthma uh, and inhalers at home and in school. And then why would I think it was my house? You know, I was an, I inspected it. It looked good. There was no water in the basement, all those things. What I didn't know was that you could have mold in your ductwork. And I found that out at a CEU presentation and then came home and removed the vent cover on our uh, vents or one of our vents. And this is actually it. That's what it looked like. And it was a 1950s house. And that's pretty disgusting. Um, I hired people to fit clean and they turned out to be a scam, threw them out in the middle of their process. Uh, the sec Once I learned who, who to hire and, and figured that out, this is the picture of what was in the ducts after he, they were done cleaning, which is not adequate. It's not clean clearly. And this is another one of my children helping clean. None of this is good. No paper masks are, are that's not enough. Um, don't have your children do this. It was aspergillus mold everywhere in the dust. And, uh, but my husband was out of town and I didn't know what I was doing. And this is really the beginning of my story. Uh, so we lived and learned and my daughter does not have asthma anymore. It took about a year for her to recover. By 2014, we were doing pretty well. Although my husband and I were now um, having health issues and this is us in a hyperbaric chamber sharing one because it gets very expensive. So here, it's, those are his feet in my head. Um, we did a lot of things to recover our health and spent a lot of money and have done a lot of research. But what was going on with my husband, which you can see in his face, 
is he had something called autoimmune high, um, thyroid eye disease and his eyes are looking in different directions. So he actually saw double images everywhere he looked. And we do believe it is related in some way to toxins. It's, there's not a lot of research on this. Um, this was considered incurable. Uh, possibility of surgery, maybe four or five. And then there was also the potential that he wouldn't see at all. So we opted not to do that and follow alternative paths. And he is, I'm happy to say, can single vision. He can see like he used to see. And he runs in races. And this is, I think, a 10K or something that I walked in. And, and he's doing great. It took about five years. But I, I share this because recovery is possible. And I want to inspire people to not give up and to, to have hope. And my family has certainly recovered from more. This is other things, autoimmune diseases that were considered permanent that we have recovered from. And, um, but the building and the environment is really a big piece. And so that brings us to what is building mold. And um, the terms usually used are fungus or mildew. Mildew is mold. So don't let anybody tell you that it's just mildew. <laughs> Um, it is mold. It's neither a plant or an animal. They have defined cell walls. They lack chlorophyll. So they are not something that's going to grow in sun. In fact, they like no sun and no light. They reproduce by means of spores. There's more than 100,000 species. In fact, some research has suggested over 6,000 or 6 million, actually not 6,000, 6 and 5 to 6 million species. And they feed on dead organic matter. And that's really important because we do have mold everywhere and it's a good thing. It's really nature's recycling system. And so we don't want to eliminate mold from the environment, but we don't want it in our buildings by any means. So the conditions for mold growth are really important to understand to figure out like, well, how are we going to stop it? Uh, mold requires has spores. And as I said, that's everywhere. Uh, they re mold requires oxygen. Again, that's gonna be anywhere we're gonna be. A temperature of 30 to 130, again, pretty much where we're gonna be. And a nutrient source and moisture itself is required for mold. So those two bottom ones are what we're gonna come back to. So is mold toxic? I get this question a lot and I get people who think it's not because they, they feel fine. I can tell you that my husband felt fine when my daughter was affected in 2005 and he didn't feel fine in 2014. So we don't always know what the long-term repercussions are. There are some species that are common in buildings. These are some of them, Cladosporium, Penicillium, Fusarium, Aspergillus, Stachybotrys, just to tell you how those are pronounced. And there's many, many more. Uh, as I said, more than 100,000 species we typically in screening tests are, are, are testing for less than 40. So sometimes in a screening test, it comes back, oh, wow, they didn't find anything. Well, that doesn't mean it's not there. It's just, they didn't find anything that on that day at that time, the way it was tested and possibly because there's some species of mold out there that haven't even been identified yet that may well be toxic. So it's a complicated and there's a lot more research needed. An awareness is starting. California and many other states are starting to publish through their public health departments documentation where this is a quote out of this one. Um, basically that the presence of water damage, dampness, visible mold, or even mold odor is enough to tell us that in, that indoor environment is unhealthy, very likely unhealthy. And so if you see mold, there's no reason, in my opinion, there's no reason to go out and get it tested, even though sometimes it's nice to know what species you have. The bottom line is you may have more species anyway, and it doesn't matter. It's all going to be treated the same way. Uh, and stopping the water is going to be a big, big part of that. Some of the symptoms are really ubiquitous and also common, so common that you don't even recognize that they're connected to your building. And that was certainly the case with my family. In fact, I would say today, I, I have four children that I raised, and I, I only thought my daughter was affected at the time. In retrospect, I would say they were all affected because when I look at this list, there was other things that started happening in our family that I didn't think was related to our building. So things like headaches, sinus infections, anxiety and depression, memory loss, brain fog, 
uh, immune system dysfunctions, imbalances, fat just fatigue. Uh, and there's GI problems, shortness of breath, rashes are really common, uh, bloody noses, joint pain, visual disturbances. And then there's a relationship that's documented in a lot of medical literature. When you look at autoimmune diseases, there, there's an environmental factor that's probably contributing. If nothing else, it's a burden on the immune system that allows these other things to um, take hold in a bigger way. So things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I had lupus and I had Sjogren's uh, syndrome and I do not have those anymore. Um, I, don't have my, I don't have the signs of them. Uh, Graves disease is what my husband also had. Rheumatoid arthritis is another one. Um, people who have trouble with insomnia, um, which is the opposite of the anxiety piece, but they can't sleep and they're falling asleep during the day. And um, so there's all, all these things that seem like really prevalent. And so how many of the people suffering for those things have an impact of their buildings that they live in? I wonder. I know the um, asthma was what my daughter had, and she does not have asthma anymore. She didn't a year after we figured it out. So I just wonder, you know, and so it's good to think about. Interestingly enough, autoimmune disease affects women more than men. And it, it seems to be in just really not scientific way that my clients are more women than men that are affected by the mold. Although there are a lot of men that are affected and often very seriously. So who is affected? Uh, and I like to look at the stories of when we had a canary in a coal mine. So the coal miners would take this little bird, very fragile and sensitive little bird down into the coal mine. And if the fumes in the coal mine got bad enough that this very sensitive bird would die, then they would know that they needed to get out because they would be next. So the, the canary was a warning sign to the stronger, pe the stronger people, the miners. And today we have mold in our buildings that's affecting some people. And I believe that those people are the canaries. They're, we should be paying attention to that because they may be lucky because they know they need to get out. Whereas some other people may just say, oh, I'm just gonna stay. And then they may have much worse uh, issues and people are dying. They're dying of mold exposure and they're having very, very serious illnesses because of mold exposure. So uh, who, you know, there's some documentation that says it's 25% of the population. I would say that's probably the minimum, but if we just look at what 25% would be in a state like California, uh, that's a million people. And if you count, if you multiply that over how many people are in the United States, it's more than 80 million people. So this is not an insignificant number of people who are affected at that bare minimum number. I would say that my whole family was affected 100%. So I'm not sure that the 25% is, is right, but um, maybe it's 50%. We don't actually know because those symptoms are ubiquitous and very common. And we don't know how many of them are affected by buildings because often mold is concealed, completely concealed. So why buildings and why now? Well, I believe it's an unintended consequence of the sustainability mm -hmm. movement. Uh, obviously the sustainability movement's a good thing. We wanna have uh, energy savings and, and tight buildings and low energy costs and all those things. But in the process, we've created a monster which is with a lot of sick buildings and, and poor air quality. And it's all expensive. It's all expensive to figure out. And so um, I welcome the discussion here and anywhere. Um, I think it's great that we're talking about it. The moisture sources are really critical because as I mentioned, that's the big deal on mold is you gotta have moisture. You can't, you're not gonna have mold without moisture. Even, even um, say a dry rot actually has a moisture component. It's a misnomer. In the interior, some of our moisture sources are the people that live there. And it's the things that we do as occupants. You know? So we, maybe we dance and sing and, and run around, kids run around, we cook, we take showers. Um, on the exterior, we have rain, which is kind of an obvious one, but we have irrigation systems often running at night that nobody looks at, um, watering our buildings in addition to the grass, groundwater seeping up and wicking against gravity into our buildings, water vapor condensing and creating bulk water, 
uh, in cavities. And then one that often gets overlooked is the moisture sources that are coming from construction itself. So um, there's water, we're pouring concrete, it's liquid. It has to dry for actually years, it's gonna keep drying. Um, things like, like drywall work and painting, and there's a lot of other um, processes, even some kinds of insulation add moisture to the building itself. Rain on the construction site. I have people with brand new homes that in a year or less, maybe two years are full of mold. And some of them irrecoverable, it's everywhere. So that usually has a construction source. Um, on the exterior, we obviously have port site, site drainage, flooding, dampness, gutters and downspouts can, they're good, but they can be done incorrectly or poorly. Lack of gutters can be a problem, even in the desert. Uh, faulty construction, so I think it's great to always be talking about best practices. Leaky roofs, a lot of some of this is maintenance, leaking walls, air leakage, like I said, sprinklers hitting buildings. If there's one thing that I would say everybody can go home and check is inspect your home, your school, your workplace, and look and see what kind of signs you see. In this picture, you can actually see signs of the downspout um, not working properly. And you can see this stain here. So those are the kinds of things that I point out to people is um, how to look at buildings because we can all do this. Everyone can do this. You don't need my background. Uh, plumbing leaks is an obvious one that is easier to find. Overflowing the toilet, the tub, uh, the sink, the sewer is overflowing. Those are all easier. Humidification can be a problem. People adding humidity, um, having high humidity and not realizing the causes. Sometimes it could be drying six people's towels in one tiny bathroom uh, or hanging clothes to dry in a basement. Maybe that's not a good idea at certain times of the year in certain climates. Steam from cooking showers, we talked about condensation. Exhaust fan errors is another big one. Uh, bathroom fans, some people don't have them at all or they're incorrectly done, incorrectly vented. Dryer vents, kitchen exhausts, whether they exist or, or, or are just done incorrectly. Uh, this picture is actually showing an attic shot of the mold growing on the roof deck that's being sucked in from the soffit. The soffits are where we draw air into the attic. So to be exhausting our bathroom moisture out a soffit vent is spitting in the wind and it's turning around and coming right back in through the adjacent vent. And it shows up after five or seven years or more. So it's not something that we're usually finding right away. And, and usually people building these are not realizing that it's a problem because they don't get to see it. Heating, air conditioning and ventilation flaws. And of course people, um, so we're all contributing. In terms of what building science is, and I'm sure you guys talk about this kind of stuff all the time. For my definition, it's about the materials, but it's also about the envelope and the enclosure and the assembly of those materials, which gets a little more complicated. And then it's about the systems. So that includes the, the ducts and the um, vents and the plumbing and the electric system. So all those things coming together to, for me is really what building science is all about. And let's bring that back to mold growth in buildings. We talked about the things we can't change. And we talk a lot about nutrient sources and I see a lot of materials that are, oh, we're, this material is mold resistant. Um, but the one thing that we really absolutely have to control is moisture regardless of the material. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because as you heard my story, we had mold on metal ducts. Okay, well, so how did we do that? Metal doesn't actually, it's not a food source. Um, this picture on the right is mold growing on a, on a roof deck, a commercial building, the metal roof deck, and it's mold growing up there. So you always have to ask like, oh, wait, what's the food source? And this was surprising to me. Um, and what's the, what's the, the, the food source is dirt and dust. It's everywhere. We don't live in our environment without some dirt and dust. It's everywhere. And then moisture is coming from condensation on a cold metal surface. So there we go. Now we got mold on materials we don't think of. So no material is immune from moisture. So we would obviously decays, but steel studs corrode and concrete spalls and then the rebar rusts and degrades. And then masonry does the same thing. It absorbs the water and then this black is pretty nasty and then that turns to dust. 
um, over time. And stucco doesn't like to move either. So, so also know that no building material is exempt from mold. This is a solid masonry wall with mold growing on it. Here we have concrete block with mold growing on it. A water supply metal to the toilet tank with mold growing on it. And we have steel stud wall with uh, sheathing, Egyptian sheathing with mold growing on it. Wood obviously grows mold as well. It could be any, many different colors and smells and, all, and you cannot see it at all. So there's a building safe and resilient is my goal. We have choices to make. I'm always trying to figure out what the right way is. And for that reason, I am a perpetual student and happy to be here. So a little bit more, this is my website. So you can find under the education tab that rest of that program and, and other things. My blog posts are free. I have videos on YouTube also. Cheryl Seco Architect is the place for that. I have a Build a Safe Home course for um, homeowners and builders. Architects have been in there. It's a six week course. You could do it faster or slower. Uh, I do come on monthly and do live Q and A's on that. And we discuss all kinds of individual details, but it's, it's everything that I've been talking about with my clients in, in a high level um, for people to get started at a very affordable rate. And they have other programs that you can find, including the one that I just talked about. Moisture Basics is another one that is a mini course for you, you to get started on and uh, for people to get started on and really trying to get to the root causes, which is my goal is getting to the root cause and figuring out uh, how to solve this stuff. So you can, I do have a free mold kit that people can download through my website, avoidingmold.com. My name, my last name is Seiko, Cheryl Seiko, and that's not a stage name. So if you can't remember that, go to avoidingmold.com. If you put in Cheryl Architect Mold, you'll probably find me on YouTube as well. So that's that. And uh, now I'm looking forward to talking about it, <laughs> all this, and what do you guys think? And um, that was excellent. Uh, the, your, one of your comments there about, uh, you know, mold growing on metal reminded me a couple of months ago, I had a friend come to me and say that uh, he was asking a question about insulation on his foundation. And I told him that if he puts, you know, foam there and water gets between it, it's okay. You know, there's no food source there on a, on a new foundation. And he said, well, if that's the case, then how come there's mold and mildew on my vinyl siding every year? I had to explain that we have pollen and we mow our lawns near it and you get all of this organic material that deposits on there and you get biologic growth. So uh, we have a ton of questions. Travis, you have anything right on the tip of your tongue that's burning? I don't, but I kind of wanted to get Bill involved since Bill was able yeah, to join us. Please. I know he wasn't probably, he's driving, so he and may not Bill be able to Bill lives really in engage. a wet place. I'm sure mold is an absolute huge problem in New Orleans, right, Bill? Oh, that's terrible time to lose Bill. Uh, Are you there? He is. Bill, you're muted. You'll have to hit the mute button to get there. Oh, yeah. It is okay. All right, Cheryl, awesome presentation. Uh, you hit all the bases, I think. And <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, you, yeah, so the, the thing about it is, it, it's all about the moisture. You know, it rains 60 inches a year here in New Orleans, and this year, I think maybe a little bit more than that. And uh, we got water coming out of the ground, coming over the levees, coming over the rivers, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're constantly on it. Uh, some things I want to touch on just to kind of go back to it. My job is to uh, go to people's homes that have either signs of microbial growth. I'm not a licensed, whatever that other thing is. And so I don't use the M word or bioorganic growth, which you can call bog if you like. Anyway, so what, what I go to people's homes when they have those elevated moisture content situations and try to help sort it out, I work with mold remediation contractors, environmental indoor people, insulation contractors, HVAC contractors, when they feel like they're getting out of their lane as far as where that goes. And basically, I go in with thermal cameras, moisture meters, and do my Columbo inspection and make some recommendations. But a couple of the points that I think are really important for where we are, first of all, our biggest problem is air leakage. Uh, and because we're not building houses to that passive house or even to three air changes an hour. And so we have a lot of air leakage. And then the other thing that we have is a lot of uh, negative pressures in the house. So that hot humid gets sucked into the interior and it causes condensation. What I recommend to people 
is we try to keep that relative humidity inside the building at 50%, between 40 and 60, but f- below 50, you don't get the dust mites growing. So that's kind of the quick overview of what I've got. And then I think that I'm just going to uh, see if I can answer some questions, if there are some, if, if Cheryl does. That's a really good one that I want to go to right away. Um, on construction sites, the conventional wisdom is that black mold is bad, but other types are uh, not, not a problem, that they're, they're not a risk. Is that an oversimplification, Cheryl, in your mind? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, black mold is not a technical term. So usually black mold, what they're usually thinking of is stachybotrys, which is a mold that it's interesting. It's, it's highly toxic. Um, it's maybe one of the most um, impactful molds that people just have to leave their homes from, but it comes after long-term damage. It's a very sticky mold spore and it actually is hard to catch in testing because it doesn't go airborne um, in the way to catch in testing. But um, my mold, the mold that made my daughter sick was aspergillus. And so, or a species, now just know, aspergillus and penicillin are both genuses with like 300 species (laughs) underneath each one of them. Um, But it was aspergillus that took her down and, and not very much. And so it was like 14% or something, it was some low number. And I, I was researching it and thinking, well, but this is, could kill somebody and she's little. Um, so obviously it was enough for her, her DNA, her ability to detoxify from her body. Um, my, one of my sons got ADD. That's one of the ones I didn't know at the time was related. Um, he had headaches also and, um, I just didn't know it was all related. But in, on a construction site, I mean, when you're outside, you have uh, you have dilution of the environment. But I do think there are issues with drying the building out so that we don't enclose the moisture. And um, but yeah, I think everybody should be cautious. I know that the I asked a cable guy once; they're not allowed to go in and install cable in buildings where there's visible mold. So what are the cable company knows that I don't need to have a test. There's like, there's not, in my opinion, and what I have researched and my experience with the number of clients that I've worked with, I, I do virtual consulting with people is that all over the United States, actually all over the world um, is that everybody's affected a little different, but there's a lot of similarities and it doesn't really matter what the species is. Like I said, there's so many different species that there's surely some really toxic ones we haven't identified. Well, and there's no, there's no benefit to keeping the mold around. No one's like, oh, well, it's not stachybotrys, so it's fine. I like it. It's good for my family. You just treat it all as if it's bad and eliminate it as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, or mitigate it as soon as possible and, and, and deal with the, the yeah. reduced risk from there. In the old days, our buildings were drafty. And... But they also were so drafty that they, one, didn't have the condensation issue because they were drafty in 10,000 different locations, you know? So as we go to tighten stuff up, now our buildings are only draft, drafty in 10 locations. But guess what? That's the same volume of air moving through the 10 locations that was before moving through 10,000. And when so it was- So the implication is that you're going to have more condensation with those- uh, Fewer but bigger leaks. Is that is that correct? That's right. It's really volume of air, so it can be very small, but the volume of air moving through there, the potential for condensation to turn it into bulk water is massive. Hmm. In a small, but you know that's that whole thing of t- oh, you know, weather strip here. We keep tightening, you know, insulation. There's a story I think in Minneapolis, the stuck old stucco buildings where they once they insulated them, they had a huge mold problem um, that they didn't have when they were uninsulated. But we can't, Cheryl, we can't uh, equate air tightness and insulation to having, uh, you know, mold problems because it's not that insulation and air tightness are the problem. It's improperly ventilating when you do those. That's the problem because you can't, you can't just build a tight, well-insulated shell and not ventilate it because that's right, right, the problem. Right. So, so uh, I'm just trying to create a distinction between, you know, energy efficient and tight building envelopes does not equal biological growth. So. No, the point really, though, was, as um, Patrick mentioned, is that it's, it's about the volume of air and the number of it. So when we say tight, it's, not, it's rarely 
um, 100% tight. You know, there's numbers for that. We, we, we calculate it. And, and so there's still some leakage. It's very hard to build a, a cooler. And, and we don't often hear of people suffocating because they ran their exhaust fan and blew all the air out of their house. You know, so air is coming in somewhere, even in a really tight building. And, and, and the problem ends up being that it's coming in either from bad places, because nature is going to find a way. It's going to find so, a way. So, so it's coming in through bad places. But if we're air sealing, that means we are reducing that quantity of flow in that number of locations. So that's less chance for bad places. And I'm not trying to be argumentative here. I just want no. to make sure that we're, we're having a, a fair dialogue. Yeah. So the question is, can you do 100%? That's the problem I see, is that it's unrealistic, on especially an existing home, to say that we can, but even new construction, it's not even required. Passive house has a number that's very small that they're allowed to build to that has a little bit, you know? So the problem becomes when it's a little bit of what is that little bit and what little bit is just enough to have some major condensation when it happens to be near a junction box or conduit or something that could be condensed. And the condensation can come from air conditioning. So say you have, you know, some, some metal bracket that's getting air conditioned from, you know, and it's cold and then you're in Louisiana and that little bracket is getting some airflow over it that's hot and humid and then it's enough to cause a bulk water issue there. And um, so that's it's a, say, really Bill. challenging. That speaks to something, Bill? Uh, I, well, I wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, I was trying not to be interrupting. First of all, this is my time to say that it's different there than it is here. You know, I mean, uh, everything is backwards going up to the thing about six mil visqueen on the inside of a wall back a few years ago. I've seen people down here in the hot humid do that. And so we have to take whatever you say up there and turn it around backwards. That's the one point I want to make every time. The other thing is, is that kind of going back to what Ben said, about making a house more airtight and more insulated that plays a little bit to those heating climates, but also we've modified the, modified the way buildings can dry. You know, Typically, you know, we dry to the inside and up north is drying to the outside, but there's some times of the year when we all dry both ways. And so when we've changed that dynamic and not managed uh, the, the moisture in the air. And so I do have one more thing and then I'll shut up for a minute. Uh, Cheryl, you can address this a little bit. I've been led to believe that when the relative humidity is banging off of 70 and 80%, that we're gonna create microbial growth. That's enough moisture in the air to, to, to make that happen. Uh, learn me on that, please. Yeah, I mean, it's relative. So it, it depends on other things, you know, the relative humidity where out, outside or, you know, there's the dew point, there's all this stuff to evaluate. And, and I did in my Build a Safe Home course, there's a module on climate. So. Absolutely. And that's, I think, one of the challenges in the sustainability movement was initially, it was just like, everybody do this. Um, and I think it also is a little bit like building a Tesla in, you know, we're trying to build these really highly efficient homes, but we're building them the same way we always have. And, and we're not building them in a way that's really controlled with the labor is the same every day and we can really control the details. But um, to your point about the dew point, I honestly would say that 55 would be my high in a hot and humid climate for an interior humidity. And I start to get nervous um, and start to look for causes when people have homes that are, are 60 or above and start to uh, look for where is this, hum is this humidity coming from somewhere else? The other issue is the HVAC systems are not designed for the tightness of the buildings, sometimes they get designed like they always have, kind of rule of thumb, as opposed to being very specifically engineered. And, and so they're not able to take the condensation out of the air as efficiently as they might be. If, if they're too big, which is usually what happens is they get designed too big and now the building's really energy efficient. And, and so it, it cycles. So it doesn't run enough to dry the coils. It like it runs for five minutes and the whole house is cool, shuts down. And then we have condensation in the coils uh, or other places. And then it runs again. It's kind of like driving your car. And every time you get to a stop sign on a residential road with a lot of stop signs, you're going to turn your engine off. 
Well, it's not, it's Cheryl, it's not that we don't have time to dry the coils, it's that the coils actually don't have time to get wet enough because it's turning on and off and we don't get enough flow across the coils to remove the latent energy from it. Uh, I think what Bill was uh, driving at, um, and maybe you can explain it a little bit, uh, or anybody here, is the mold index. That's something that I keep seeing bantered around is mold growth index and what that means for establishing risk in a building. Um, you know, in you mean in terms of relative humidity? Uh, well, the mold index is, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I, trying to I, learn here. It's a it's a national standard or a national research standard for establishing and uh, <coughs> judging the the risk of an assembly based on temperature, based on relative humidity. Because, well, I know what I think Bill was driving at is when we hit above ninety percent humidity for an extended period of time is when we can see wood moisture contents go above twenty percent equilibrium moisture content which is the situation where we start seeing biological growth. So I think that's what Bill was getting at there. Um, something yeah. that's interesting, to, oh, go ahead, go ahead, please. I think it's every material, first of all, I mean, wood is good. You can, wood is used often in aquatic facilities with really high humidity. So it's, it's, not, it's not completely just that um, the wood moisture content is gonna all of a sudden, it's gonna start degrading. It has to do with so many of the other pieces, but um, it's, I mean, it's clearly a, a complicated topic. And I think those are all tools that we have to look at and not in a vacuum. So there's that, and then there's this, and then there's this, and then, and you know, there's all these other things. So that's what I do. And I know Bill, you kind of mentioned the Colombo thing. I feel like I'm Nancy, the Nancy Drew, anybody who knows who that is, of, um, <laughs> of the building inspection world. Um, or psych or whatever that, you know, where I kind of can look at stuff and see the flaws before other people do. The biggest challenge is always going to be when it's concealed and that's in those wall cavities where, um, or, or attic spaces or crawl spaces or wherever they happen to be. Uh, air conditioning seems to be connected. Um, there's some really old homes in like Louisiana in particular that have been around since the 1700s that were probably fine um, until air conditioning came along. And then um, we end up with that cold air ending up in crawl space, you know, that whole, it's, I wish it was easy. I, all I can say is that it, there, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, there's just a number and we're good. Um, I think that's where I, my cautionary tale would come in. And I, I wish that was the case, but I think it's a lot of stuff to look at. It is. And to your point, Cheryl, a, a lot of this is, it is complicated. There's a lot of layers to look at, but I, I guess I want to be cautious because I do feel like the, at least in my experience, which is not, I did not get sick. My family's not had your, your travails, but I am allergic uh, to mold myself. That's why I have three allergies. I can't take penicillin. I've always got to do all that stuff. But the, the gist of it is uh, in, at least in my experience, the way that we have always pursued solving to eliminate mold has started with eliminating water intrusion and then solving for the condensation as part of that. And that for us takes air tightness. Becoming um, in control of that air change allows us to, to have the flexibility to dial all this stuff in. So the, the 1700s Louisiana house that was leaky and didn't originally have air conditioning, uh, it, it didn't I wouldn't say we blame the air conditioning for creating the mold problem. It created the mold risk because we hadn't solved for it at the exterior where the moisture was finding its way in. So I guess I want to make sure to make that delineation for our listeners, which I, I'm sure most folks are already across that line anyway. But the, the idea of controlling these things in such a way that we treat the house as a system, we understand that if we if we are going to cool things, we also have to dry them, which is generally what the air conditioner is doing. It's it's mostly dehumidifying, uh, it, at least on a day like today in Kansas City, where it's 92 and about 85 percent humidity. And I'm on my third shirt by lunch. I I feel like that's an important thing on our end because we can't eliminate the mold food. The cellulose is part of the system. I'm still hanging drywall. I've still got sawdust in the walls, even though we do a good job of cleaning up. The studs are still a cellulose. It, it's just, it's just, a, it's a complicated system to your point. 
you and Bill are both on the same page about this. And I think that's where Bill's expertise is so valuable, where he talks about so much on Instagram with these flashing details and these sealants and all of these extremely important critical means to make sure that we don't introduce mold food in water into the environment and controlling it from there on in. I think that's where the, the majority of the solution comes from. For, for me, and obviously there's been a lot of chat and excuse me, a lot of comments in the chat about it being uh, frequently a new construction problem because there is so much moisture, as you said in your presentation, in the concrete, in the drywall finishing, in the paint. So it's, it's the management of those things. And I think so much of our risk is reduced with dehumidification and air conditioning, but it still has to start with water management. Absolutely. I'm totally a fan. Yeah. And, and I would say I am a fan of air sealing too. I mean, I'm all about air sealing. The challenge is air sealing versus um, a breathable air sealing. So air sealing versus vapor open vapor barriers is, yeah. um, you know, there's like a whole lot. We could talk an hour about that alone. So, um, but I absolutely am all about air sealing. I recommend people get blower door tests and try to evaluate like, okay, where, where is the stuff going? Cause there's, we're building, we're human beings. We're human beings building buildings, are building buildings. It's not being, they're not being built by a, in a factory on, an, on a line like a Tesla car is. And so to have that kind of efficiency as human beings, there's a, there's a chance that there's somebody put their phone down and did some, you know, and then forgot something. And, um, and that's, that's the challenge that we have to work with. But yeah, I'm a fan of air sealing. Uh, flashing 100%. If you watch my video, if you see my videos and whatever, that's it's like a lot about drip edges and flashing and and connections between materials. So we get a lot of education from material suppliers individually. But where's the leaks happening? Well, it's where this material meets this material, and are they compatible with each other? And who, what, where'd that tape come from? That wasn't specified, and it's actually going to degrade this foam. You know, it's like. Um, all these new materials. And uh, so it's at, at the connections, at the junctures, and then um, sometimes other things having to do with the design. And I'm a designer. I don't want to, you know, but, uh, but sometimes the design is deficient. And I talk about that too. It's like, well, okay, this, this, this roof has got a bathtub in here. <laughs> There's just, how is this going to drain water? The way you could complicated roof lines. And it's like, wait a second. There's this section that water can't get out of looks great, lots of fancy roof pitches, but what are we doing here? And, and inevitably that'll be something that'll fail over time. I'd like to ask you both, like, do you see, are your clients uh, living in new houses? Are they living in old houses or are they living in old houses that, that have had, you know, energy upgrades? Uh, Cheryl, you go first, or is it all over the map? It's all over the map for me. So I have clients in multi-million dollar houses, um, brand new, brand spanking new, uh, and everything down below. And then I do have the older homes too. Uh, the older homes can be, well, they usually have a lot of additions. So as somebody is added on this piece and added on that piece, they get really complicated in that regard. And um, there's really very few homes that haven't had energy upgrades anymore. I mean, it started in the seventies. So, um, and then you have other things in older buildings that can be a problem, whether it's asbestos or lead or, um, what else? Um, you know, years of decay <laughs> and stuff. So, um, but for me, I would say it's, I don't know that I have, I could say that it's, I definitely am. I caution people about new construction these days. What's the worry? Um, poor design hmm. and poor construction. So uh, there's, I, I might, it's possible that the majority are newer construction that, um, I mean, I, I literally homes that are a year and a half old, that concrete foundation, say this, take one example. Um, everybody's rushing to say you have a basement. Everybody's rushing to finish the basement. And that concrete wall that got poured, it's going to take a couple of years to fully dry. I have a, I had one client and I've seen this over time, but they put this giant insulation over the foundation that has like a vapor barrier over it. Have you seen it? It's like a roll, roll it out. Well, those of us in the mold industry 
um, and the building industry call that affectionately a diaper. Yeah. Because that concrete wall is trying to dry. It's got to dry for a couple of years. And then we don't even know what the outside impacts are uh, on, you know, that from the ground soil that might be adding to the moisture. And so I had a house that brand new first owner. She saw that insulation. I said, just get it out of there and then we'll reevaluate. And there was one section that the remediator asked if, asked me if he should remove the drywall under the stair, because that was the only part that had drywall on it. And I, at that point, I was like, yeah, go ahead and remove it because we should get all that insulation out. The insulate, the drywall a year and a half in was full of mold mm -hmm. against the, on the foundation side. So um, it, it's, we want it, I get it. We want to finish that basement ASAP. I think it's I'm uh, really risky. And then we have things like carpeting where a slab or a basement that the water's wicking up from the foundation and poor site design. Or over time, the site design has not drained away. I mean, there's a lot of designs that are like the buildings drawn on a straight line. Oh, <laughs> how's that work? Um, the code is down six inches and 10 feet and the code has exposed the foundation six to eight inches, depending on the location. It's just not happening. And that's hard to fix, but I see that over and over again. And I have clients, Texas, Florida, the Carolinas, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arizona, New Mexico are not immune. Lots of clients there, whole East coast, uh, Chicago, I mean, it's everywhere, Minnesota, <laughs> you know, so, but they're all so little that, different problems to your point, Bill, that the climate is creating, if there's a little bit different problems with similar um, causes. It sounds like the, the code has figured out ways to prevent this from happening to buildings. It's just people aren't following code. So then the onus for these issues becomes code enforcement. Um, it, so if we're having all these issues, uh, how do we manage them? How do we get rid of it when it's in the building? What do we do to seal it, to encapsulate it, to remove it? Um, Bill, you want to field some of those? Because I know you've had quite a bit of expertise here. And I have a lot to say too, Ben. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, you know, Patrick had asked about what kind of homes. I mostly work on older homes. And an, an unfortunate thing about where I, I just arrived in Lake Charles, we're going to do some video and training on how to retrofit after the storms we had last year. So hopefully that stuff will be up here pretty soon. But the, basically the people that mostly need the work that Cheryl and I do can't afford it. You know, I mean, I make a bad joke about it. If I don't show up in your driveway and if you don't have a Tesla or a BMW, you probably can't afford me. And I know that sounds arrogant, but, you know, I got to pay a truck payment anyway. So, so I, I, I think that the whole idea is being able to understand just a little bit more about what this means. You know, I, I'm starting to see on Instagram people use more and more moisture meters now. I think that's amazing. That's cool. We should have been using those a long time ago. You know, I used to do a thing at JLC to ask contractors, how long should wood flooring be in a house before you install it? And, you know, you get 24 hours, 48 hours a month. And, you know, the whole point about it is when it, when it reaches equilibration, you know, when it reaches that moisture content that it's going to end up at. And it varies, you know, up north, that interior moisture content is going to be 6 to 8%. Down here, it can be as high as 12% and it'd still be okay. And so I think that we just need to, first of all, better understand the consequences, you know, there's too many people that are still doing stuff the way we've always done it. You know, and we all know that old bad joke. How, how are you doing this way? We've always done it. And it's a challenge. And talking about the codes, keeping up with it, my, and I guess I'm just going to mostly complain, but my concerns here are the code officials may or may not really even understand that kind of stuff. I know I've been asked by local code officials here in South Louisiana to come in and do some training about some of the stuff that I talk about, you know, the equilibrium moisture content, uh, you know, what, at what percent does microbial growth occur? When does wood decay occur? And then the big ticket that I'll stop on now, because I start seeing like I'm rambling, but is that when we're drying the house, everything needs to be below 15% moisture content before we close it up. And that goes specifically to what we're doing here in Lake Charles, because people, these houses flooded, either the roofs blew off or the water came up, and they're in a hurry to cover those walls back up again. And these are in all different ranges of homes. And the problem with it is, if you cover up a house before it's been able to dry, it's not going to work. And the number that I go to is 15%. And Cheryl, I'd like to hear your comment on this, but 
I've asked the question around, and my understanding is microbial growth will typically occur mold at 21%. Some molds will grow down to as low as 16%. That's what I've been told. And so my 15% moisture content is my number. So tell me, Cheryl, learn me again. <laughs> oh, that's a great topic. Um, and I have looked into it a lot. So the thing about moisture meters, one is that they're usually, they're, they have to be calibrated. So I usually say, if you're going to use a moisture meter, you got to be knowing that you could be three percentage points on either side. And sure. so your 16 or your 15 could be 18. Depend, you know, you have to get a bunch of meters to compare and make sure it was calibrated uh, correctly. What I usually am trying to do is, so the Forest Products Lab, um, out of Madison has a wood handbook that is available for free online, the PDF version. Um, ben, you maybe you know about it. Um, it's, great, it's great to have in your uh, yeah. reference collection. And so what I'm looking for is the equilibrium moisture content, whatever it happens to be for that location, that place. And so what I do is I look for where is some wood in this building that has not been affected that has not been affected by whatever the event was, whether it was a pipe leak or a flood or um, whatever it was. And then I say, okay, well, so in Minnesota, maybe it's, it's well, outside is usually around 10, 11 in Minnesota, inside might be six or seven, eight. Um, so then you find this spot and say, okay, 10, let's try another one, 10, nine, 11. Okay, so we know what range we're in. That's what all the other wood that isn't affected is at. So what I do is I suggest that that's what we should be shooting for if we're trying to dry our building out is back to what it is in the areas that it wasn't affected by, you know, where it wasn't affected by the water event. So um, yes, I've read I, the same research you have in terms of mold grows at 20, around 20 on wood. I definitely specify, I would specify a new construction moisture content of 15 below, kiln dry to 15 below. I don't like the idea of 18 below, but it is usually, or 19, it's usually drying in the process. But if you can get the ones, the wood that's 15, kiln dried to 15, I would. But um, so it, it really depends on the conditions and the situation. And in a very hot, humid summer, you might have a higher number in the equilibrium than you would if it's at a drier time of the year, for instance, if you ever have one in Louisiana, I'm not sure, but that's what I focus on. And I do have a webinar with a, a, a moisture meter expert that I have on my website on moisture meters that um, she talks about all those, because concrete is another one. I mean, we can measure the moisture content in concrete. We don't usually do that, but it's a big impact on the other, it's a giant sponge. And so if it has been underwater, it's, it's like it's almost new and came out of the truck. It's got a lot of drying to do because this wet sponge and then is it gonna dry into the walls? And then is that, so I try to measure areas that are say end grain. So that's the other thing on wood is that the cut end grain of wood is where the water, it's like the ends of the straws that wick, the water wicks up to the top of the tree from that point. Cross grain, it doesn't soak in as quickly um, but the end grain, oh yeah, it'll wick up a couple feet against gravity, cell by cell uh, by capillary action. And so I always am looking to measure at like the base plate where the cut end of the stud is meeting the base plate because it might be more wet there and then also measuring at the center. So I like the idea of penetrating moisture meters um, that go beyond up to like an inch or two into the wood member because wood will dry from the outside, but the inside's still really wet. And it's still gonna dry through the outside from the inside. It's just gonna keep happening because if the inside is 21 and the outside is 15, then we're not done. You know, on something that's like a two by four, um, a four by four or something like that. So those are kind of the nuances that are kind of tricky that I would share. One thing I'd like to toss in on that to, to comment, I, I get it about the meters. I have a half a dozen different kinds of meters, Delmhorst and Wagner and Lignomat. And, and I reference those uh, different times in different places. But I wanted you talk about the equilibrium moisture content. I think that's a totally cool thing. I have a, a Wagner Orion 950 that's Bluetooth. And so I can actually record the readings on my phone. 
and it will do quarter inch pinless, it's non-destructive. And it will actually calculate the moisture content of the surface it's touching. It'll calculate the temperature and relative humidity and the EMC. And I understand that there could be some variations there, but that's kind of a cool tool. That tells me a lot. You know, I, I believe that those, that data is how I can charge people what I charge. Them. Yeah, that's very cool. I don't have that. I don't have that. I cut pretty basic stuff, but I do have the penetrating things. And I think that's, that's a piece that hasn't been done or promoted very much. You can actually do it with your quarter inch. You can put in, usually you can put in like two screws, the same dimension apart as the pins and go in deeper and you might be able to measure, it'll actually transmit the electrical energy. It's basically just measuring the water that's connecting on the ends. Um, to know is, in a, say a two by four, if you are at the base where the end grain is and you go into the center, so you're in a half an inch on one, in one direction and you're in an inch in the other direction, are you getting the same moisture content at the center as you're getting on the surface? And that, that's what I think is, an interesting piece of the puzzle that often gets overlooked and that might be significant, especially when you have ganged studs and stuff. I've seen situations where actually it happened to me once um, where you have like a gang gang studs and there's space in between there. And sometimes that's really nasty and it's hard to dry. It's like trying to dry your towels when they're all already folded, <laughs> you know, <laughs> They, they don't want to dry inside because they're all next to each other. Well, ganged wood studs are the same way and they're next to each other. How do they dry from inside? And you can sometimes with the penetrating meters and the ones that you buy that have, that usually used for EFIS, um, but they're Teflon coated so that you're actually not getting anything but the end um, in the reading. And then you could, you could basically stick those inside and say, oh man, we got to actually pull these two pieces of wood apart because they're just not drying or we need to focus heat here and fans and, and really monitor this because this one location is not drying as well as the others that are fully exposed. But it's a piece of the puzzle that I think is really important to consider, especially in those flood conditions. And we have that. And I think that plays back to that point about, you know, uh, don't we always say that a building needs to breathe, right? Actually, I think what we need to say is the building needs to dry. And, and, and that's the whole thing about considering how much moisture is in all the building components and what have we done to allow it to dry. And that's a whole other thought that isn't in the building code. Um, the, you know what is under, misunderstood, I think, is the permeability piece. That's the breathing. So, like, if you go jogging in a Gore-Tex jacket, you'll, it'll breathe. If you go jogging in a hefty bag <laughs> or a plastic garbage bag, you'll be not breathing. So it's, you still might have the same wind effect that it's stopping airflow, but it, it's the breathability has to do with the qualities of the material, which is permeance, permeability. That is another topic that is like so confusing for your average person, even for me to explain that, you, you know, so, okay, something's breathable. Well, what is the perm rating? And, and, it's, and it's this relative thing of, Oh, you're one, you know, point zero one decimal points away from being an, a vapor barrier, <laughs> or it's actually some, a material that's breathable, meaning that moisture can move, can dry through it to your point that the dryability, and I would just say that the dryability is related to permeance. And this is where it's all really complicated of air sealing and water sealing is important and also breathability and dryability related to permeance of materials. But it's all um, the devil's in the details, I think is what I often say is that, you know, so yeah, oh, it's dry. Remediators all the time. Oh, your stuff was dry. Well, what moisture content did you get? Oh, I don't know. It just felt dry to touching it. Okay, <laughs> that's not okay. And the same thing is true of well, I put up this barrier. It's an air barrier. Well, what perm rating is it? And they, nobody knows. And and there's a point where it becomes a hefty bag and not a Gore-Tex jacket. And I think so the could... important piece to add into that is uh, your permeability is not just that number, but it's the time, the time you allow for drying. Mm -hmm. It's not just that moment of permeance, but it's the duration 
of that drying event before re-wetting, before you introduce the problem, the cause of the problem again and again. And I think that's where we run into a lot of problems is because we think, oh, you know, like I use a ton of rock oil. Well, that's a vapor open insulation. Fantastic, right? That's great. Don't forget to water seal the damn house. Keep the yeah. water out. And <laughs> then it, you've lowered your risk substantially more than, than concerning yourself with vapor open concepts and assemblies. If you keep it out, then that's the safer solution. But to your point, we're not 100%. So you need both. And I guess that's, that's one of the strategies that has come up again and again in the chat is, uh, and you mentioned it a little bit as far as like focused heat, focused fans, different things like that. We need to, we need to help our, our uh, attendees. Uh, and, and frankly, I need you to help me because I don't know how to do this either. You know, in, in my area, if you find mold, everyone's like, oh, get the spray bottle and add some bleach. Let's get to work. And I know that there are a whole host of other risks that you introduce when you start spraying chlorine bleach into your environment and the noxious fumes that are associated with that. So can we offer some strategies to our, our viewers? Um, is there, I realize there's not a blanket approach for solving anything, but are there some reasonably safe first steps that both of you could suggest as, you know, obviously we gotta find the, the source of the problem first and fix that, but in dealing with what's inside to keep your family safe, what, what are our starting points? What, what would you recommend? Really? Go ahead, Cheryl. Go, okay, well, I'll throw out. I'll throw out. Uh, well, you, you know, my whole thing is, I think you've already touched on it, Travis, is I get involved in these projects because somebody found a stain or some other kind of a thing. And I come in and find the source or identify what the source is and come up with a strategy to mitigate that first before the mold remediation company and the rebuild company come back in. And then it's my position. I'm not trying to take money out of a mold remediation contractor's pocket. I think if there are visible stains, they need to be cleaned up. But I also think if we can control the moisture, mold is everywhere all the time. If we keep that moisture down below that magic number, it's a non-issue anymore. Now that's my opinion, right? Cheryl. I would say number one, stop the water. And that gets lost because people go in, they say, oh, I got this problem, I see this stain, and then they get the mold remediation. Mold remediation is cleaning, which is a step. That's my number three step. Number one step is stop the water, which means you gotta figure out why you have it in the first place. And, and sometimes it's like kick out flashing or some kind of something weird on the outside that the is not in the expertise realm of the remediator. So they go and they, they dry it and they clean it, but the, the stopping of the water didn't happen. So then it happens again the next time it rains. So I say stop, which means you have to find the water. And I get a lot of my clients are, are clients that have hired other people before me, <laughs> actually. And um, which is, I feel bad, um, but it had, you know, we all, I hired the wrong person. And I should know what I'm doing. I heard the wrong kind of duck cleaning. I didn't know what was involved in duck cleaning. And there's all these people that are salesmen, salespeople. And, and so, um, so I would say if they're telling you they can't find this, the reason they're just going to go ahead and remediate, uh, stop, stop the boat, you know, stop the train. Let's figure out, let's find someone else who can give some um, educated input into what might be the causes of this because paying all that money for mediation when you haven't stopped the cause is um, folly, I think. And it's a waste is, of money. Is the cause obvious, Cheryl, always, or is it nebulous? Is it both? For me, it's, it's gotten pretty obvious, but I do this all the time. So, um, and, and, and so for affordability, I do have all this recorded content, but so there are times, I mean, I have some time, sometimes when somebody's sick and they still feel sick and they've done everything else and I, and I, and I'm struggling. It's, it's pretty rare those occasions, but usually this is the thing. Usually it's more than one thing. Very, very rarely have I found that the, the water source was only one thing. So it may be that kick out flashing and it may be the site drainage and water soaking into the slab or the foundation or um, the toilet seal leaks under the slabs or the um, downspout stuff, all kinds of downspout stuff where um, they go in the ground and no one ever knows where the water actually comes out. I and mean, it's actually not going in the ground but nobody's standing out there in the rain seeing it overflow 
during the rain event or maybe only during the heavy rain event. Arizona, New Mexico, they basically do very little with drainage. They have all these, a lot of flat roofs that are, seem to be truly flat, scuppers, dumping water on the walls, because it doesn't rain very often. And, and to, you know, was mentioned you know, about that, or Travis, you mentioned it about getting wet over and over again. In those desert climates, Oh, they just need, when they, it doesn't rain ever until the time it does rain and it's a deluge and they get so much water that it is, it, it, it has. So the one thing actually, Bill, you were asking about some things about wood is that it has to be able to dry fairly quickly. Wood can dry a little slowly if it has access to it. Drywall is 48 hours. And, and when people see a stain, that means the water has gone all the way through the drywall. And, and that's usually a tip of an iceberg and that whatever's behind there is probably not drying quickly. Um, and, and so that's always a, a caution to me, but I would say stop the water, which means you got to figure out what it is. And you can watch my recorded stuff. You can watch my free stuff and you'll find a lot of the free mold kit has a lot of stuff. Moisture basics course, my mini course, I go, over, there's 25 defects in there and I go over 10 in depth. And that's why I would start there. And, and, I, and I have been able to teach people. So my goal is just teaching people how to be good clients, good homeowners, and to find some of their own stuff. And then, you know, bring me in for the next level, but drying, drying meaning with a moisture meter that you actually are measuring dry. It's not, I touched it, felt good. Does, so does does spraying bleach actually work? Does it do anything? Does borax actually work? Does it do anything? All right, so my public service announcement for the day on bleach. So the thing with bleach is it will work on non-porous services. So like your toilet tank. Um, how many build products in our buildings, how many materials we use are actually porous? Concrete is porous, wood is porous, brick is porous, drywall is porous. There's like virtually nothing, I guess maybe metal would be okay. But the problem is that bleach is 97% water and 3% sodium hydrochloride or whatever the bleach chemical is. And the thing about bleach is that it evaporates very quickly out of the water. So you have to spray a lot of water on something that's moldy and have, and then the bleach will get the surface clean and then it's evaporating immediately, toxic fumes for sure, but it's evaporating immediately. And what's soaking in is the water. The 97% water is soaking in the block, the concrete, the wood, the drywall, anything. And so if, if bleach doesn't work, what works? Because just so that we've got, so we're arming everybody that's listening with some sort of yeah. basis to be able to, to tackle things effectively. So there's certain materials that have to be removed, in my opinion. And that would be things that are like upholstery, and though you've probably seen this in flooding, things that can't dry fat, you know, that upholstery, upholstered chairs, um, drywall, rarely if something's been really wet. Now, if it was wet on the surface and it's a painted surface, you know, maybe that's not a big thing. But if it's stained from behind, I think drywall's cheap, folks. Open it up and look. <laughs> yeah, that would be my advice. Um, I actually had a situation that there was a mouse nest and the, the pee from the mouse actually went all the way through the drywall and um, caused, there was a little mold in that. Um, so not that much water really, or, or liquid. But- Pee um, is equally hazardous to the mold in that scenario, right? Like you got to, you're replacing that drywall regardless. Your yeah, a, a we, bad deal. it was a weird situation where this, the drywall was stained in, an, in kind of a blotchy way in a place that there was no water. Yeah. And so they came to that where it's like, oh, heck with all this. By the time I keep looking at all this, we can just cut a hole in it and look. Right. We you need know? Rob Wadsack on for this. Help us out, Patrick. Didn't Rob have that exact situation on? He was talking about it on the, on the pod. Something about staying. I think it was Matt scene. Noham actually oh, had it. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of weird stuff. But, um, but I, I think for me, it's about, you know, stopping, making sure you really have figured out what the leak was. And, and I had an insurance claim once that I did, they had three roofers in because every time it rained, the basement light fixture leaked so much that they had a garbage, a garbage can down there to collect the water. 
So it, it rained on the roof and came out the on three story house, multi-million dollar house came out the basement light fixture in the middle of the house. And I was talking to the remediator and I was like, oh, pick me, pick me, tell them if they can't figure it out, I, I, I love a challenge. So I was like, I think I could figure it out. And I did. And what it was, was nothing to do with the roof, but it did have to do with the gutter that was clogged and overflowing. And you could see the overflow lines because the dirty gutter left a stain where it was overflowing onto a balcony. And then since, since I, so, I have an advantage in that I know how buildings are built because I can design them and build them. So I know that this, this balcony is the, is the, the framing cantilevered. And I start looking there and like, oh, wow, there's a lot of caulk here. Somebody must have had a problem here. So the water came overflowing the gutter, landed on the balcony, went in the floor joist, which was the laundry room. What do we have in the laundry room? We have a soil stack. Came across the floor, the laundry room ceiling, and the floor joists of the, of the deck above came down the soil stack and then over on some conduit and came out the light fixture. That's what happened. And only in big rains. <laughs> so, but that's the kind of stuff where it's like, it, it is complicated because especially anything coming from above, they can travel really far, the water. And so you basically have to open stuff up. So my advice and what do you do? You either have to hire somebody like me or research my stuff, or you open it up and you keep going and you find the trail. So another one happened to me where, okay, here's, there's nothing here. And I just finally said, okay, take a tile off. Let's look behind. Can you tell the tile guy, can you get one tile off? A big one by one tiles and then look and as soon as we could see that that's where there was mold there and you could see the trail now the wood was fine because it had dried but you could see whoa it came from over there remove the escutcheon plate on the thing and there's a big hole back there and water was getting behind there and dry and traveling and this it wherever it landed and couldn't go any further was where the mold grew Okay, so, we're slowly closing in on our time limit here. So uh, I, I wanna kind of get some parting thoughts. Um, the big question in my mind, I guess, after all of this is, is how do we build buildings that minimize the risk of mold? Um, Cheryl, uh, you're still unmuted, so um, give it a rip. All right, so my, my, easy, my advice is simple buildings. Simple, simple roof structures, simple shapes, big overhangs. It's like a giant umbrella over your building. We'll cover up a lot of errors that might have happened by the human beings involved. Positive drainage away at the foundation. Expose your foundation six to eight inches. I would actually say do more. You can always put dirt back. It's hard to take it away. And then down six inches in 12 and 10 feet away. Positive drainage. Before even after the landscapers come back and put all the wood chips in and the landscaping and then ruin all that. So it has to be, so site design. Uh, and then a mechanical engineer to design the HVAC system, the heating, air conditioning and ventilation system so that it's sized properly for your location, your climate, your orientation, the number of trees. Is it west facing, north facing? How many windows? What's the our value of the windows or you value of the windows? All that, that would be my tip. Mr. Robinson. I am still here. Well, I think Cheryl, once again, uh, is, is, is right on top of all that. I would just point out the, the building envelope. You know, I think that uh, I've been fussing around with this kind of stuff for several years and the building envelope never was really a consideration. That's what you mailed your car payment in with was an envelope, right? But now the building envelope is actually a really critical and important thing and understanding how we detail that. Uh, just make it so that you have intentional ventilation, no air leakage, no unintentional air leakage. But the bigger thing, I think, is to have a team of people who are working together that are maybe all sit down at one time before the job starts. And I know that doesn't happen often in the regular world. I know a lot of stuff y'all are doing, like I'm guessing, Ben, you have a lot of pre-construction meetings, but most of the stuff I see is there is only a, a meeting at the attorney's office after the fact, you know, building envelope, plan the job. 100% agree. Good. Have a team. 
have a team and starting from the beginning before you're done designing actually. Yep. Plan your work uh, I want your plan. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I just want to toss in one thing, asking about unusual stuff that occurred. I ran into a, a situation a couple of years ago where this was in a vaulted or volume ceiling, cathedral ceiling, and there were stains at, at the top uh, by the ridge and, and they weren't tested. It was just like everybody kind of figured what they were. And it's like, how could that have happened? And so what I ended up doing was using some of my uh, little psychrometric, hygro, whatever you want to call them, uh, and check temperature, relative humidity, and dew point at countertop height and at 16-foot beam height. And there was a 30% difference in relative humidity. And I know the relative humidity gets thrown under the bus, but the temperature was also higher too. So the point about it was, is it confirmed some things I'd heard people say that not only is warm air buoyant, but moist air is buoyant. And so what that brings us back to then is the issue there was ventilation. And I'm making a pitch that we need to put the V back in HVAC. That's it. It may have also, that was fantastic, Bill. <laughs> Something called the stack effect. I think there's something called the stack effect that I think was also at play there. And, and there's, um, there's some research on that in SIPs buildings. We actually, in my camping, so I was camping, this getting back to the beginning of where my travels have been. I was camping in this metal trailer with massive con uh, condensation. And when it was, when we were in cold locations, just from our breath. And what we figured out to get the condensation to go away and to not become a problem, even with some heat running, was to leave the vent open on the ceiling. And it's counterintuitive because it's not energy efficient for sure, because we're running the heat and we left the vent open, not running, just open. But we would not have the condensation on the windows that we had when we didn't do that. And I can only imagine it's what you said, Bill, where that warm, moist air was going up and it was exiting as opposed to being collected inside this tin can of our trailer. My, my oil guy's gonna love me when I leave my attic fan on during January. Yeah, it's no, not the, the fan, on. not the fan. It's, it's about venting, it's about venting. So I didn't have the fan running. So, but it's, you know, this is all learning I think as we go and, and as we realize what this problem is and what's a possible solution. Yeah. And I think that's the team piece is, is bringing people together with things like this, where you kind of hash it out and go, wow, I didn't think of that. Well, I wonder if that and this, and then you, and then we try it and hope for the best and keep learning, keep learning and keep talking. And education, I think is at the crux of all this, which is, you know, now virtually we can have all kinds of education and learning from each other, learning from people doing it like you guys and, and myself. That's a fantastic segue, Cheryl. Um, that's why we do this, learning, right? Mm -hmm. Travis, you want to wrap things up for us? Of course. Uh, I would just want to remind everyone that uh, these shows are always available, the education piece on uh, Fine Home Building Green Building Advisor. You can learn about a lot of different topics. Of course, you can visit Cheryl's website. You can follow uh, Bandana Bill with two N's and one L on Instagram and keep learning from these people because there's a ton of this stuff out there. So every time that you run across something that you think, oh, this is, this is what they were talking about, go ahead and share that with someone else. And that kind of keeps it going. And we all learn from each other. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Bill, for your time. Thank you, Patrick, for guesting. It's always a pleasure to see all of you. I got to thank you too now, Ben. God, just forget it. See you guys next week. Take care, Good night, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate Bye you all. all. Thanks, Thanks Cheryl. Pleasure. Thanks, Bill.